If you've been following the news in the past few years, you'll know that the UK has committed to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2050. This means that while the UK will still be able to emit CO2 by this date, any emissions should be balanced by carbon capture technologies. In order to achieve this quite ambitious goal, the government has set up an independent body called the Climate Change Committee, which advises on five yearly carbon budgets that the UK will need to meet in order to achieve the 2050 goal. And so they've developed a plan that takes us from a business as usual scenario shown in the black line on the top to a net zero pathway, which should take us to net zero by 2050. And it includes a number of interventions to the economy and our energy usage. This includes things like demand reduction. That means a 35% cut in their view in meat consumption um, and also taking fewer flights. Another big chunk is in orange, which is electrification. That involves converting polluting energy usage into electricity. For example, using electric vehicles or converting gas boilers into electric boilers. The third important stage is converting the UK's currently carbon intensive electricity generation into low carbon alternatives. And that segment's shown in the blue line. It is smaller than the other lines because the UK has already made quite a lot of progress in getting rid of coal from our generation. But there's a double challenge here um, to our electricity network. On the one hand, we have to phase out coal and unabated natural gas by 2035, shown by the purple line, while simultaneously working towards doubling our electricity generation by 2050 in order to meet the additional demands from the electrification of transport and heating. This is obviously quite a big challenge and the Committee on Climate Change predicts that two thirds of our future energy generation will come from variable renewables. That means that by 2050, according to their plan, we should be producing more from renewables than our total electricity production at the moment, which is quite a massive uh, goal to aim for. There's other important forms of generation too. In the dark orange line is um, gas with carbon capture technology. In the lighter orange line is what they expect our nuclear output to be at that stage. But clearly we have to uh, select what form of electricity generation is going to provide this massive amount of electricity. And at the moment, there's two current commercial forms of renewable generation. Those are solar and wind. And our balance of those depends quite a lot on the UK's electricity demand. That's shown in the graph and you can see it's cyclic by nature. What's going on here is that during the winter months, the UK's electricity demand peaks as we use more electricity in our homes and also some electricity for heating. Whereas in the summer months, our electricity demand is in a trough because the UK's summers are quite mild and therefore we do not rely on air conditioning. The problem that this has with uh, solar production is that solar production peaks in the summer months and has a uh, low point in the winter months. Additionally, solar farms, big ones particularly, require quite a lot of land, which isn't always available in a small country like the UK. Wind, on the other hand, it does have similar um, demands for space, but luckily we can install wind turbines on the seabed economically, mitigating that. Additionally, the energy generation profile from wind energy suits uh, the UK's energy demand well, where we get large uh, peaks in production during the winter months when the wind speeds are higher and the air has a lower density. And it also has troughs in the summer um, when the wind speeds are lower. So the Committee for Climate Change predicts that wind, therefore, might make up to 60% uh, of our um, renewable energy generation by 2050, with solar still playing an important role at about 14%. But what are the wind turbines that produce all this electricity going to be like? They're really complex machines that combine elements from all different types of engineering, including mechanical, aeronautical, structural, 
and electrical engineering. They're also really massive. Um, if we were in the Chadwick building today, I'd point out at the BT Tower and tell you that the wind turbine I assessed during my PhD was the same size as that tower. And that's only one of the turbines located in a farm. They have a number of structural components. The first is a substructure, which is a cylindrical steel member that's hammered into the seabed. On top of this is a placed a platform that's secured by cement. On top of that is bolted a tapered steel member called a tower, and that supports the hub, which includes um, all the expensive and important generation equipment, including the generator and the gears, but also the bearings that allow the turbine to rotate. Attached to the hub are three carbon fiber blades, which themselves can be very long at around 80 meters in length for one. A typical wind farm has about 100 to 175 of these individual turbines installed over an area potentially as large as London. All of these wind turbines are connected back to a substation which collects all the electricity and transfers it onshore. Because building a single wind farm is such a complicated infrastructure project, um, the institution that owns the UK seabed called the Crown Estates um, has auctioned wind turbines in a number of bidding rounds. And what happens during a bidding round is that the Crown Estates will auction off a small piece of the seabed on which a wind farm can be built. The first round was um, in the early 2000s and it encoded small wind farms close to shore which have gradually moved offshore as the technology has developed. Additionally, with these increases in the uh, wind turbine capacity and also the size of the wind farms, we have found a corresponding decrease in the levelized cost of energy, meaning that the cost of energy from a wind farm that is due to be built in round three is approximately half that for the size well nuclear power station that's currently being built. The limitation there is that these cost estimates for the round three wind farms are just estimates and they highly depend on the amount of electricity the wind turbine will produce during its operating life. And, and that's why one of the things we have been investigating is the capacity factor or how much electricity UK wind farms are likely to produce. So on the uh, map on screen, you can see colored dots that refer to the size and location of different UK wind farms. The difference in size of these means that the smaller wind farms generally produce lower electricity than the higher wind farms. We can compare the efficiency with which different wind farms produce electricity through a metric called the capacity factor. And that's just the total electricity produced in a time period divided by the installed capacity covering the whole wind farm times by the number of hours the wind farm has been operational. So that gives us the efficiency of the wind farm as a percentage. And I've plotted the capacity factors that will have been measured for the Barrow UK offshore wind farm for every year of its operation. The interesting thing here is that within every month, there is a high level of variability in the capacity factor as indicated by the box plot. You can also see the trend in capacity factors through the year that I mentioned previously with a peak around January and December and the trough in June and July. We have this capacity factor data for every UK wind farm and it will be updated every year as we get new generation data and therefore a Bayesian modeling approach would be a natural way in which uh, to model this data as it will be updated over time. The Bayesian model provides a flexible approach for evaluating a parameter of interest, theta, which is our capacity factor based on observed data. And that's achieved by inverting a conditional probability of the observed data given uh, a value of the parameter we're interested in, which is very easy to evaluate. And the prior assumption about the distribution of that parameter, p theta, which we select based on currently known information. Extending these Bayesian models into hierarchical models 
give us extra flexibility by expanding the prior through another conditional probability distribution. And this enables us to implement hierarchical structures that can capture the relationships between different sets of observations. So in my example, those different sets of observations are the capacity factors for the UK's different offshore wind farms. The model can be represented as a graph to show you more clearly how it's been implemented. And you can see that on screen. The, uh, the ultimate goal is to model the capacity factor for our individual wind turbines. And that is determined through two parameters, uh, the mean and the standard deviation of a normal distribution for the capacity factors. These in turn depend on an intermediate variable, which is the mean of the wind farm standard deviation and the mean of the wind farm's mean for each round. Because a priori, we expect that the uh, technology used to, to build the wind turbines has advanced quite substantially between the different rounds. And therefore, it's a good surrogate for um, how efficient the wind turbines are. These two parameters are modeled again using a normal distribution. Then the hyperpriors are selected to be diffuse because we don't have any particular information uh, relating to the distribution of any of these parameters. So this model can be evaluated using Markov chain Monte Carlo to produce a posterior distribution of our um, capacity factor parameters and therefore to predict future capacity factors for the UK's offshore wind farms. We assessed convergence of the Markov chain using a multivariate potential scale reduction factor which is just a metric that uh, determines whether the Markov chains have converged to the distributions that they are sampling well. And we implemented a model checking using a Bayesian p-value approach, which is uh, determined by uh, Andrew Gelman in his book, Bayesian Data Analysis. Here, what you do is you assess the quality of the model by comparing the sample data you trained the model on to posterior samples of the capacity factor um, using the trained model. And you can compare that for different metrics that you are interested in in your observation sample. In this study, we used four, the minimum, the maximum, the mean, and the standard deviation. And the box plots represent the variance in their results um, across all the UK's offshore wind farms. There is no extreme values noted below 10% or above uh, 90%, but there is more variability in the minimum and the maximum. This typically occurs for wind farms with only one or two observations of the capacity factor, where we're relying on the diffuse prior more in the Bayesian model, and therefore we have a bigger distribution than the mean or the, the minimum or the maximum in our observed values. The mean and the standard deviation are modeled very well, and this is to be expected as they are parameters of our Bayesian model. We can use that model then to predict the distributions of capacity factors for UK offshore wind farms, and that's what's shown on this slide for two wind farms. Firstly, the Barrow wind farm, which has been operating for 14 years, and secondly, the Gwynty Moor wind farm in Wales that's been operating for five years. The results from the Bayesian model are shown as a line histogram. In both plots, a grey histogram indicates a different model that we used that can predict the monthly capacity factors, but I didn't show you it because it's more complicated, but it's implemented exceptionally similarly to the yearly model. Um, the dotted lines indicate the capacity factor observations, and you can see that both um, of the farms have a good agreement between the um, observation and the Bayesian model. And so what this model allows us to do is understand the variability in the capacity factor values, particularly for farms with a low amount of data. This can be updated as the farms age, so we can get a better estimate of the capacity factor. An additional benefit 
is that through the, um, the hidden parameters that relate to the round, we can estimate the capacity factors for like a generic wind farm um, from a different round. And doing that, we can see that the average round one wind farm had a capacity factor of about 35%, and round two, about 41%, indicating an improvement in efficiency between the two licensing rounds. We can then use these capacity factors um, to validate the levelized cost of energy calculations to understand what the variability introduced into the costs are from our uncertainty in the capacity factors. And that's done on this slide. The, the way we evaluate costs for energy assets is using something called the levelized cost of energy. And this is simply the total life cycle cost. So the cost of buying the turbine, its blades, the cost of installing it, and the cost of operating it, divided by the annual energy production across the entire asset's life, so in every year of operation. You have to discount that um, energy flow with respect to the um, interest rate in the, the year that the uh, turbine um, production, the energy production is um, occurs. So for the barrel wind farm, we've seen there is a very low standard deviation in the levelized cost of energy over the life of the asset. Whereas for the Gwinty Moore wind farm, we have a much bigger standard deviation. And the reason for that is the amount of data available to make the levelized cost of energy estimate on. For the barrel wind farm, I have 14 years of observation, which I have recorded, and then the remaining 10 years for which I used the Bayesian model. For the Gwinty Moore, I only had five years of observed data and then 20 years for which I used the Bayesian model. And this one over R to the power of N factor discounts future inflows of energy. So that means for the Barrow wind farm, I'm only using the Bayesian model for 10 years and those values are discounted to about 20% of their full value. Whereas for the Gwinty Moore, I'm using the Bayesian model for 20 observations and uh, the values are discounted by about 50% in that case. This provides us quite a rational way to capture uncertainty in the um, cost of energy for offshore wind assets that are still in operation but don't have long track records of observations. As we increase the number of observations for those wind farms, we can update our Bayesian model to reduce the um, uncertainty and the capacity factor, and therefore also in the levelized cost of energy. So this is a tool that we'll be hopefully continuing to use, and they'll be providing updated estimates for the levelized cost of energy. Um, another thing we've been looking at is climate change and the effect it might have on offshore wind turbines. And that's because, as I mentioned earlier, offshore wind turbines will operate for a life of 25 years. And over this time, changes in the environmental conditions will have a consequence for both offshore wind turbine energy production, but also in terms of their structural response. The problem is changes in the climate are not deterministic. Uh, they depend on modeling assumptions and also assumptions about the level of CO2 that's going to be emitted into the atmosphere. A number of studies have already investigated the impact of climate change on wind speeds around Europe, and some have focused on wind turbines, but only looked at the power production. A typical um, prediction for the wind speed around Europe is shown on this slide, produced by Tobin et al. The areas in blue are where they predict the wind speed will decrease on average. The areas in red are where they predict the wind speed will increase. We can see there's broad, slight uh, decreases in the wind speed around the North Sea and in the Mediterranean, with increases in the wind speed around the Baltic Sea and in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean. There's also some localized places where they predict there will be increased wind speeds, for example, around uh, Gibraltar and off the Iberian coast. Other models from different offers find additional locations where there's localized wind speed increases, for example, 
some places off the coast of France and in the Irish Sea. But before we can model the, uh, the impact of this potential climate change on the future wind turbines, we need to understand what are the environmental conditions now. And to do that, what we need to do is we need to convert wind and waves into a number of parameters which we can use to model the wind turbine's response. There are typically six parameters used, three relating to the wind, three relating to the waves. They include the mean wind speed, which is self-explanatory, the turbulence intensity, which is how much variability is there in the, uh, the wind, the wind angle at which it uh, flows into the turbine. Then there's wave parameters, including the significant wave height, which is how high on average are the waves, the peak spectral period, which is how long are the waves, and the um, wave inflow angle. Um, we can assess distributions for these parameters using measured data from MET masts. And in this study, we used the Pheno 3 MET mast, which is located in the North Sea and has over 10 years of continuous um, recordings of the environmental conditions. One of the important distributions to note is the mean wind speed, um, where we fitted a Bible distribution that has two parameters, a scale and a shape parameters. The marginal distributions for all the other parameters are shown in this slide, but the wind and wave conditions are correlated because the wind speed typically uh, drives the wave heights. And so we use the copula in this case to model the correlations um, between the parameters. We updated these um, environmental uh, distributions for different climate change scenarios um, using a parametric approach. And this is because there is generally little agreed um, change in the uh, mean wind speed between different papers that we reviewed. So we used this parametric approach where we selected intervals for the scale parameter and the shape parameter of mean wind speed distributions based on a literature review. We maintained the uh, correlation between the mean wind speed and the other environmental conditions. This is obviously a simplification, but we think it is justified given the uh, little data that exists. And given that the mean wind speed is typically the variable that causes waves. Here on this slide, we can see the effect of changing those parameters of the mean wind speed distribution. Um, the scale parameter has a big effect on the mean of the mean wind speed. The shape parameter has very little. Um, these parameters also have very interesting um, effects on the wind turbine's operational behavior. So for example, low scale and shape parameters mean that you get many more situations in which there is too low wind speed for the wind turbine to operate and extract energy from the wind. The obverse is true. Um, high scale parameters combined with low shape parameters lead to an increase in the proportion of the time the wind turbine cannot operate due to storm conditions, meaning it has to shut down and protect itself. It's relatively simple to model the effect of these changing scale and shape parameters on the power production because the power production only depends on the mean wind speed. And for typical offshore wind turbines, we have a relationship between the mean wind speed and the power generation like the one shown on screen. You can see at low wind speeds, there is very little generation and at high wind speeds, the turbine has to shut down to protect itself. Then between the uh, cut-in wind speed is when it first starts generating and the rated in wind speed, we have an exponential increase in the electricity generated. That saturates when you get to the rated wind speed for the turbine um, and it maintains that maximum energy production up to the point it shuts down. So if we combine that power generation curve with the uh, different scale and shape parameters of our mean wind speed distribution, we can evaluate how sensitive the power is to these different parameters. And comparing our baseline scenario, which is shown by an X on the right-hand plot to the maximum, we find a 15% increase 
um, or a 12% decrease between our baseline and the minimum condition. But the thing we were really interested in is whether the changes in the scale and the shape parameter have an impact on the structural loading. And there's reason to believe this may be true because when you're evaluating structural loading, you raise the wind speed to quite a high power and therefore you'd expect it to be quite sensitive. The way that structural loads affect wind turbines is through the fatigue limit state. And what happens here is that if you load a structure below its uh, ultimate limit state once, it'll cause no damage. But if you repeatedly at that load a number of times, you can cause small cracks to grow through the structure, eventually causing failure after a number of load applications. And this is exactly the type of load that offshore wind turbines experience. In the animation, you can see a typical structural simulation for a wind turbine, where we've got a rotating uh, blades at the top of the structure that introduce cyclic loading. Additionally, you have a uh, cyclic loading from the waves on the monopile. This results in fluctuating stresses um, if you look at the stress in a component over time. And the way we evaluate whether a crack occurs as a result of these stresses is by using experimental tests, which are shown, the results of which are shown in figure three, where in an experimental setting, um, someone will test a, a given stress um, and they'll test the structure at that stress until it fails and evaluate the number of cycles that cause that failure. So if we read single stress cycles into this graph, we can evaluate the number of cycles of those stress range that will cause failure. Then if we count the number of stress cycles of that range over the wind turbine's life and divide it by the tolerable number of cycles from the experimental results, we can work out a ratio, which is the ratio of damage. And if that ratio is greater than one, the structure will fail. But the important thing to note here is we have to add every single stress cycle that occurs over the structure's life. And this is quite a complex task because it requires us to assess the environmental conditions the wind turbine will experience throughout its entire life. And those environmental conditions are defined by a six parameter multivariate distribution, meaning we have to sample across that entire six parameter distribution. For every sample of the wind conditions, we have to run a structural analysis to get the time history of stresses. And this structural analysis can take 10 minutes. This leads to a huge computational burden and would make stress analysis for multiple scale and shape parameters unfeasible. The way we got around this in our study was to use a statistical model based on Gaussian process regression that can be evaluated very quickly, meaning that we could run a fatigue damage evaluation at every single combination of the scale and the shape parameter we selected. And the results from that study are shown on this slide. On the left, we have the fatigue damage, the results from different scale and shape parameters. And this is found to be more sensitive than the power production, where moving between the baseline shown by an X and our maximum value is a 25% increase. And moving between X and our minimum value is about a 20% decrease. That compares to a 15 12% increase and decrease for the power production. Then, knowing uncertainties in the material properties that constitute our wind turbine, we can work out the probability of failure. And this is found to be even more sensitive than the fatigue damage. Now that we have the probability of failure, we also know the costs for the wind turbine and the probability of failure and the costs for all the other components that comprise the wind turbine from studies by other offers. If we combine all that data together, we can evaluate the expected annual material losses for our wind turbine. And the interesting thing here, which is shown on the right hand side, is that it is really insensitive to changes in the probability of failure of the structure as a result of climate change. And the reason for that is, while the probability of failure of the structure will increase a lot um, if the wind speeds get higher at a site, the failure, the absolute failure of the equipment components, such as the generator, is much higher than that of the structure. Um, and so you don't see a massive increase in the expected annual 
material losses um, as a result of the climate change scenarios we assessed. So bringing all those results together, um, we plotted a kind of sensitivity study for different parameters of the offshore wind turbine, where the lines show different assumptions about the scale and shape parameter of the mean wind speed distribution. We can see that the power and therefore the revenue that results from power are sensitive to some extent. As I mentioned earlier, there's a 15% increase or a 12% decrease um, in the most extreme scenarios. The damage is more sensitive with about a 20% increase or a 20% uh, decrease when we look at the more, most extreme scenarios. The probability of failure was found to be even more sensitive, but the expected annual losses have an extremely low sensitivity. Then finally, the revenue loss from failure of the structure is kind of on par with the probability of failure. The uh, consequence of this study is that in future studies looking at what the effect of climate change on offshore wind turbines will be, you should definitely look at the structural loading in addition to the power. And that's because the structural loading is uh, magnified to a much higher degree than the power production and revenue, and therefore might be a better indicator of how the wind turbine um, will respond to different climate change scenarios. So that's the end of my uh, presentation. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you very much. Very well done. Uh, yes, as usual, uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand, unmute yourself and ask. Uh, also, you can type it in the chat and I will read it aloud. Um, very interesting topic. Um, one thing, um, did I understood it correctly that your worry of climate change is mainly for having higher wind speed that your tur turbine will get damaged than locations that your wind is gone and your turbines are useless now? or both of them are possible? Yeah, the, the thing is that both are possible. It depends entirely on where the uh, wind turbine is located. So mm -hmm. the reason we took the approach that we did was because looking at different studies, they have different predictions about what the future climate could be at different sites. Um, generally, you're right around the UK. Um, most studies predict decreases, small decreases though, in the wind speed that might mean that wind turbines actually end up to be over designed for those sites and might have additional capacity but um, you will be in the optimum chart that you should um not necessarily no we... because as i um so on this slide we've got the scale and the shape parameter and if they if they reduce which means a reduction in the average wind conditions the power production will reduce as a result of that okay um, one other thing is you talked about the fatigue. Um, may I know where is the fatigue happening? Is it like concentrated on the blades or is it the, the vibration of the tower or the transmission, the generator? Which one is the most critical, let's say? Yeah, so in our study, we only looked at the um, structural components. And the way the structure functions, it's like a big cantilever beam that's attached to the seabed. So you get uh, very big stresses right at the seabed with the monopile so that's where we focused um the majority of our work okay and i guess you get massive displacements and drifts as well of the tower itself yes yeah, so at the top of the tower you maybe get a couple a meter or so of displacement a meter. wow yeah. the the interesting we've been looking at floating wind turbines so they're they're not actually like moored fixed at the seabed um, and some of the displacements you get there are really massive, like they can move maybe 10 meters forward and back. As well as the base as well. Yeah, the base moves forward and back, yeah. <laughs> um, can I ask your opinion? It's not related to this, but um, I was looking at how other countries are doing uh, with green energy, to, uh, for example, Iceland, Norway, uh, Kenya are doing very well, but population and the production of the power that they have is like not comparable to like bigger countries. Um, comparing to Germany, are we doing well or are they doing better? And if we are not doing well in terms of percentage of, let's say, green energy, why is it? Is it because of investment? Is it because of management? 
Is it like UK started later? I think uh, the UK is doing relatively well because we've cut out coal production or coal energy generation from our electricity supply quite a lot. So um, our, our power production is reduced a lot. Whereas I think in Germany there was some issues after Fukushima because they cut their nuclear um, power generation and had to reactivate a number of coal power plants. Um, so in that sense, the UK is doing relatively well. Yeah, it's like 0% in coal electricity now, which is amazing. Um, and talking about nuclear powers, do you think they'll come back as more popular? I know like UK is like investing a lot as well, so yeah. Yeah, the reason why the nuclear power was so small in that prediction by the um, the Committee on Climate Change was because of the expense. They Part of their job is to find the most economical way the UK can achieve net zero. And in their modelling, they they had nuclear power around the price of the Sizewell plant in the UK, which is £94 per um, megawatt hour. Comparing that to wind, it's a big increase. And even they, they factored in not only the cost of producing the wind, but also the cost of connecting that wind energy to the grid. Um, because I think that with um, energy systems that are based on renewables, there's some complications when you connect it all to the grid. Okay. Um, again, if anyone has any question, please feel free. You can type it in the chat as well. You can raise your hand, you can unmute yourself. Uh, another thing is you mentioned that the lifespan of a wind turbine is about 25 years. Um, does it produce the same energy throughout is this 25 years or this energy generation drops massively? That's why we get it out of the system. Uh, that's a question that we don't really have a full answer to. There's been some studies that looked, um, actually, you know, this is a very relevant question because we might be doing a MSC summer project on exactly that topic if someone's interested in it. Um, so to date, some people have done studies looking at how power production from onshore wind turbines declines with age, but we've not seen a recent study on offshore wind turbines. Um, and the reason is possibly because we don't, didn't have much data um, when that study was done. It was done about five years ago, when maybe we'd only have a few wind farms with long operating histories. But now we've got a lot more data, so we could possibly do a much bigger study there. Interesting. I'm sure the MSc students will be attending today's MSc uh, project pitch, which uh, you will explain more about this project. Uh, I can see Ahsana raising her hand. Ahsana, please. Hi, David. That was, that was very interesting. Um, some of the things went just through all oh, over oh my head. So <laughs> I was just catching up on um, the Dyson network, the Aurora the network, the modeling that we did in the beginning of our presentation. Um, maybe I missed a few slides in the beginning, but could you please tell me what are the parameters that actually go into your Dyson model? And um, what are the parameters that you, you go to the prior distributions for? So, I mean, uh, this is basically the energy divided by the number of hours and so that, that particular parameter that you're not removing there. Okay, I'm, I can't exactly hear the question, but I think it was about the Bayesian model and yeah. the inputs to it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so uh, the inputs to this Bayesian model are the uh, energy generation from all UK wind farms, which we were able to access from the um, the UK's energy regulator, who keeps a record of um, renewable energy generation. And um, so that was the data. I only showed you one model, but we did compare a number of different um, distributions for the different uh, parameters. And uh, interestingly, we found that yeah, the, the, the normal distribution suited the data um, pretty well. I don't know if you had any, I mean, the algorithm, so the algorithm was just the standard Markov chain Monte Carlo sim simulation, which is quite commonly used. Um, and we, we tuned that to the data using a kind of standard updating parameter method, because you have to, uh, you have to basically for the Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, 
you have to select a jumping distribution, which de determines how quickly your sample gets built. Um, and that, that we updated during the simulation. Mm -hmm. so I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was looking uh, to how you have different parameters into your Bayesian model, and uh, you would eventually have a connection between maybe some of the parameters uh, that lead into an ultimate thing, like that is the mean and standard deviation of your final uh, production of something. Okay. So you said this is the energy um, input that you gathered from all of those vehicles. Um, is the only input? Or, um, yeah, so, uh, okay, so how did I pick the structure of the model then? Is that the. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So the structure of the model was to some extent determined by the computational resources we had available because we had about uh, 20. 20 to 30 wind farms, um, and each of them have a parameter. Um, in the monthly model, um, then you have that number of wind farms times 12, which results in quite a lot of parameters. And in order to achieve convergence of the Markov chain, we had to limit this, the number of parameters in the model. Okay. So we, uh, we also selected the rounds by comparing a model that didn't have it in it to uh, one that did, and it was found to improve the fit of the model. So that's the way we did it. Yeah, thank you. That's really cool. Thank you. Okay, uh, Andrea, please. Yeah. Hi, David. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Really interesting and uh, quite well uh, presented. Uh, I was wondering, could you tell us something more about how you calculate the total life cycle cost? And does it include the occurrence of extreme events? Or because, for example, you said the, the, life, the life cycle is uh, 25 years, you neglect them. Uh, could you tell us something about that? Yeah, so that's an interesting point. Yeah, we didn't uh, include uh, the possibility of like an extreme event that could cause failure of the turbine and the life cycle costs. But that could be an interesting thing for the future. What we did was we took published data um, that exists for different UK offshore wind farms. Um, we found someone who was an accountant who had been through um, all the UK wind energy projects and evaluated um, the total capital cost. So we used that data and we're quite confident that it should be accurate. Then for the operation and maintenance cost, that is and the cost you required to be invested to look after the assets as they age, and we'll use um, industry standard values that come from other publications. So yeah, so I think um, yeah, when we're looking at the uh, levelized cost of energy prediction, uh, the, the the absolute value wasn't um, the most important thing. It was the the standard deviation in that, um, and that's because while our capital expenditure estimates were quite accurate, we think the um, operation and maintenance costs were estimated. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Um, if there is no more question, I will thank Dr. David Wilkie again for such an interesting uh, presentation. If you don't mind, I'll share my screen for a second again. And uh, so, yes, I'm sure you can all see. So, yep. We will continue our online edition seminars next week as well on 10th of February, the same time on Wednesday, uh, where Ahsana will be uh, talking about seismic analysis of confined amazing buildings with flexible uh, diaphragms. And then uh, we will have epicenter seminars coming after that as well, for example, uh, the matrix space Bayesian network for reliability analysis and decision making of large scale engineering systems. Uh, anything else? Uh, um, please feel free to follow us on the social media. Most of our recordings are also available on Epicenter YouTube channel. So with that, I'll thank you all again for attending this session. I'll thank my presenter, David Wilkie as well and uh, keep safe uh, or have I missed something? There is something, thank you, Dave. Okay, perfect.
Thank you very much. Um, we'll see you later. MSc students, please join us in a few hour, uh, in, in an hour in, yeah, at two o'clock for the MSc uh, research project page. Thank you very much and we'll see you later. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, well David. Done, David. Thank you. David. Bye.